Good evening, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight on behalf of the Dunhuang Foundation. My name is Anne Feng, and I am an assistant professor of Chinese art at Boston University. This is our last lecture in the Arts, Environment, and Materiality along the Silk Road series. And I would like to thank Chris and Julia for creating such a dynamic platform for the study of Dunhuang, as well as Aurelia, who assisted with organizational details. It is my great honor to introduce our speaker, Professor Xin Wen. Professor Wen is an assistant professor of East Asian Studies and History at Princeton University. He is the historian of medieval China and inner Asia. His work goes beyond the dynastic units of Tang and Song and situates China in the connected world of Eurasia. His research interests in medieval China also include manuscript culture, urban history, and digital humanities. This year, he is one of the recipients of the Henry Luce Foundation ACLS Program in China Studies Early Career Fellowship. For this fellowship, he is developing a new project titled Capital of the Past, Urban and Cultural Transformations of Chang'an, year 900 to 1400. He shows that even though the urban structures of Chang'an experience a dramatic transformation and destruction after the fall of the Tang, the enduring interest of its residents and visitors in revisiting and reviving its imperial sites kept its memory vibrant to this day. Today, Professor Wen will be giving us a special preview of his current book, The King's Road, Diplomacy and the Remaking of the Silk Road, year 850 to 1000, which will be released by Princeton University Press in January, 2023. The book examines the ways people traveled between Northwestern China and Central Asia in the 9th and 10th centuries. So without further ado, please join me now in welcoming Professor Wen. Thank you very much, Anne. And, and I would like to also thank uh, Julia and Chris for their invitation and for organizing this event. Uh, so now let me share my screen. Thank you all very much uh, uh, for coming here tonight. Uh, so like Anne said, uh, today I will be giving an overview of uh, my upcoming book, The King's Road, Diplomacy and the Remaking of the Silk Road. And uh, I, I, I went on the Princeton University Press website uh, today and I found out that they actually uploaded the, uh, uh, the cover of the book. So uh, as you can see, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Dunhuang paintings, uh, the cover uh, is, a, uh, is that of a diplomatic encounter uh, uh, that uh, we uh, find in the uh, Wu Tai Shan painting uh, in Cave 61. So the goal of this project is to uh, examine the idea or the concept of the Silk Road from the perspective or using the Dunhuang materials uh, and especially Dunhuang documents. Um, you know, we're familiar with this concept, right? This is a, uh, a, a, an overview of uh, what uh, people usually consider uh, the, the, the space that's covered by the idea of the Silk Road. Uh, the concept was coined by uh, Ferdinand uh, von Gesthofen uh, in 1877. And it was this, con this idea that, that, that um, goods uh, and especially silk that appear in Chinese uh, sources were the origin uh, of uh, the silk that appeared in uh, Greek, uh, Greco-Roman sources. And, and in fact, uh, there was a uh, route, and, and this is the uh, red uh, line that you see on this map, that uh, we can reconstruct using uh, Greco-Roman geographies and uh, accounts in Chinese histories, uh, such as uh, the Han Shu uh, and the Shiji. Um, so this idea, obviously, you know, uh, has uh, become uh, very popular that, you know, uh, every, uh, I, I think every uh, person in, in the audience today uh, will be familiar with. But with the popularity uh, comes the problem of overuse, of, of saturation, of, you know, uh, of, uh, of uh, unclear uh, uh, definitions. Um, and, and I will cite one criticism of the concept uh, from uh, 
archaeologist uh, Warwick Ball, who said that the Silk Road, the idea of the Silk Road now has become both a bandwagon and gravy train with an endless stream of, stream of books, journals, conferences, and international exhibitions devoted to it reaching virtual mania proportion. Um, so this is the question that I'm trying to ask. Is the idea, is the concept of the Silk Road essentially a 19th century uh, 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 fabrication that has nothing to do with medieval or pre-modern sources? Uh, and is something is the concept something that we should stop uh, uh, using? Uh, we should should we uh, try to find uh, alternative uh, ways of describing long distance connections in the pre modern world? So this is the question that I uh, that I went in with uh, uh, when I started uh, working on this project. And the way that I try to address or try to answer this question is by looking at uh, Dunhuang materials. So here is an overview of what I want to talk about today. Um, uh, the first part of the talk, I'll, I'll, I'll try to use Dunhuang materials to reconstruct a world of long distance travelers uh, in the medieval time. Uh, and then uh, in the second part, I will try to ask uh, about the nature of these journeys. Uh, that I just described. And then finally, in the third part, I'll try to sort of reflect on whether what we're seeing in the Dunhuang materials uh, uh, can be called or should be called the Silk Road. And if yes, then uh, how does it enrich or how does it uh, uh, refine our understanding of the term? And if not, uh, what other terms uh, we, should, we should actually be using? So part one, the world of long distance travel. Um, the reason to focus for me to focus on Dunhuang, even though you know the Silk Road is such a uh, extensive uh, idea that covers many different places, uh, there is uh, there are many good reasons to focus on Dunhuang. Uh, the first good reason is uh, is clear from this map, right? Dunhuang sits at a very central location on the Silk Road, but the more important reason for me as a historian uh, of mostly texts is that Dunhuang is a place where uh, uh, thousands of manuscripts uh, from the medieval period were discovered. And that is, um, and, and, and I'm here, uh, of course, talking about the famous library cave, uh, cave number 17 in Dunhuang, which uh, I consider the single largest archive uh, for Silk Road history. This cave was discovered by uh, a monk called Wang Yuanlu uh, in the year 1900. And then after his discovery, uh, there were many uh, European uh, uh, explorers such as R. Stein and Paul Paleo who visited the cave and uh, took uh, them back to Europe. Uh, but some of the manuscripts were uh, still in China and, 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 and many in Japan and Russia. So now, you have this global distribution of Dunhuang uh, document that all used to be in this uh, very small cave. So just to give you give you an overview of, of, of these uh, Dunhuang materials, and, and I think you know people had different calculations uh, because what counts as a Dunhuang manuscript uh, 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 can be very tricky. It can be a very small fragment or a long. Uh, long uh, uh, scroll that that runs for you know several uh, dozens of meters. Uh, so uh, uh, so you know uh, I think this is sort of my uh, my maybe idiosyncratic uh, uh, numbers. Uh, my calculation of the Mohan manuscript uh, 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 basically yields uh, these type of numbers, right? About eighty. Almost ninety percent of the Dunhua manuscripts are are in Chinese. The the overwhelming majority of them are. Uh, Buddhist texts, but as you can see uh, here, there are also substantial numbers of uh, 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 secular documents. Uh, about you know ten percent of the do documents are in Tibetan. Uh, again, vast majority uh, 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 Buddhist texts in Tibetan, but uh, several, uh, but but also substantial number of uh, important secular texts such as the Tibetan, uh, the old Tibetan annals, uh, shown here. Uh, there are also uh, Cotonese texts, you know, uh, several hundred of them, uh, and then Sogdian text, 
um, you know, and then Sanskrit text, Uyghur text, and then there's a single uh, Hebrew document. So to use these uh, uh, texts for historians, um, um, as a historian, I'm focusing not on the Buddhist documents, but on the more secular uh, uh, side of the story. So the secular documents uh, in Dunhuang, uh, in, and, and I should have mentioned this, uh, that the cave, the Dunhuang Library Cave was closed in the early 11th century. And as you can imagine, you know, the closer to the closure of the library cave, the more dense the materials uh, uh, would, uh, would be. So the overwhelming majority of Dunhuang documents, uh, the secular uh, part of the Dunhuang uh, library collection date to the period uh, uh, between uh, roughly 850 and 1000. So in the history of Dunhuang, we call this uh, the Gui Yijun period. Um, uh, you don't need to, uh, 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 we're, we're not gonna get into that. Um, so this particular period, 850 to 1000, um, uh, I chose this because this is where the vast, uh, the vast majority of Dunhuang, uh, 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 secular documents, uh, when uh, the vast majority of secular documents in Dunhuang date to. But there is a, a broader point or, or coincidentally uh, focusing on this period uh, actually uh, addresses a broader question. And the question is summarized here uh, by uh, Philip uh, Curtin in his uh, Cross-Cultural Trade in World History. So here he says, relatively open trade across Asia occurred uh, once in the Han, Parthian, uh, and Roman period. Uh, at the beginning of the Christian era, it happened again in the Tang Abbasid period of the seventh and the eighth centuries. And it was to happen for a third time uh, in the Mongol, uh, during, uh, uh, during the Mongol empire period, uh, starting from the, uh, uh, the, the, the 13th century. So the period that I focus on, uh, that the vast majority of the Dunhua materials are, 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 date, uh, are, are from, uh, date to this period uh, of, uh, you know, at least according to this one scholar, um, of uh, decline of transregional uh, trade. So it allows us, focusing on these documents, allows us to see the mechanism of this time of a supposed uh, uh, decline. Um, so this will be important uh, for the argument of the book. So. By using the Dunhuang documents, we can actually begin to, to reconstruct uh, the way that people traveled long distance uh, in, uh, uh, in the medieval period. So here I'll give you a few examples of, uh, of documents and, 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 and show that uh, how they actually help us understand uh, long distance travel. The first text is a, uh, um, uh, a prophecy book. And uh, I've highlighted the line where it says, there will be wine and meat if you go east and it will be auspicious to go south on this day. Um, but if you go, if you're going west uh, uh, or, or, or north, you will, be, you will be delayed. So these are the kind of texts that, uh, uh, that travelers would have to consult before they uh, go on their day's journey. Um, and, and we have evidence of people actually consulting these, uh, these books in Dunhuang documents. So if, imagine if you're a traveler uh, in medieval Dunhuang, uh, there are things like this to help you uh, uh, plan your trip, right? So this is sort of the first step of, of a journey. Uh, but another aspect of the preparation is more physical. You have to have uh, uh, camels to uh, carry your stuff for you. So here is a contract uh, for someone who was uh, going to the capital, meaning going to uh, uh, the Chinese capital at the time, either Kaifeng or, or, or Chang'an, um, and who borrowed one yellow male camel for that journey. So we also have documents uh, showing this aspect of the long distance travel. We also have uh, societies that's called the Society for Long Distance Travel, uh, uh, or in Chinese, Yuan uh, Xingshe, where uh, people 
uh, organized into uh, sort of mutual help or mutual aid groups for people, for uh, members of the society who were traveling for uh, diplomatic purposes for, uh, for uh, uh, the government. So what they do is that uh, members of the group, uh, members of the society would provide a uh, wine and food uh, for travelers who were departing. And, and then on their way back, they will also throw them a party of, uh, uh, to welcome them. Uh, so these documents allows us to see, uh, allow us to see the, the sort of social dimension of these, uh, these journeys. Uh, and then in Dunhuang, we also have uh, uh, something uh, like uh, uh, a path to India, uh, which I, I see as a road guide. And you know, this is a famous text for a, uh, a monk who was traveling from, uh, from uh, Kaifeng to, uh, to India. And it lists the steps that uh, this particular monk took and the time that it took for him to get to the next stop. Uh, I put the first leg of the trip on the map, and as you can see, uh, it tells us how uh, the distance between uh, uh, point A and point B, and uh, in 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 the in terms of the distance, but also sometimes in terms of the days that uh, one needs uh, to travel. And then, uh, you know, in addition to that kind of road guide, we also have more narrative types of road guides that tells you, uh, you know, the road that leads to Dunhuang by way of the old Yangguan, old Yang Pass, um, there are many uh, precip uh, precipitous places. Uh, there are eight springs on this road. Uh, so if you need, uh, uh, if you uh, are preparing water, uh, maybe you don't need to carry water with you because there will be springs on the road. Uh, the road will be treacherous and cannot be passed at night. So uh, you should only travel during the day. Uh, and then um, in spring and the fall, the snow is deep and the road is not passable. So maybe only travel uh, in a uh, warmer season. And, uh, you know, we have uh, letters of introduction. And, and here is a, a letter that's uh, studied uh, very extensively by uh, Fan Sheik and Columbus's uh, uh, Manuscripts and Travelers and by uh, a uh, Tibetan monk to another Tibetan monk about the passage of a Chinese monk. And here uh, the Tibetan monk says, may I ask a favor regarding a Chinese monk who has been in my presence. And the monk, the Chinese monk wishes to go to India. So please uh, take good care of him when he reaches your, uh, 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 reaches your monastery. We're, we also have similar letters uh, in Chinese uh, in the context of diplomatic travels. And so these letters, uh, as you, you can see, uh, will, uh, uh, were very important uh, in our understanding of the traveler's life uh, on the Silk Road. And we also have, um, once you get on the Silk Road, once you, once you started your journey, uh, you will need various uh, things. Then, um, and, and not all of them you carry with you. So to address this issue, um, so when you are short on, you know, food or drinks or paper, uh, what do you do? Uh, in Dunhuang materials, we can see that there are examples of Dunhuang government offering goods to uh, diplomatic travelers uh, who are visiting Dunhuang. Here's a list of uh, wine that was given to, uh, to envoys from uh, Khotan uh, uh, and, and Ganzhou. Um, and here's a, uh, a, a, a list of paper given to these travelers. Uh, so uh, these uh, goods are, were obviously very important to them. We also have, um, but the travelers were not just uh, 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 getting things uh, from their host. They also sometimes give uh, things to their host. And here is an example, sorry, with the, the wrong way, uh, of a gift received uh, from a Cotonese travelers to, uh, to Dunhuang uh, that, uh, uh, who delivered one piece of white uh, jade to the Lord of Dunhuang. 
But another issue that a traveler would encounter on the road, you know, uh, and one thing I, I sort of forgot to mention is this world that we're looking at uh, from A50 to 1000, which is um, instead of, of wor a world of many uh, large empires like the Tang, the Tibetans, and the Uyghurs, now we have a, a, a collection of smaller states, Dunhuang, you know, Khotan to the west. Uh, southwest, Torfan to the uh, northwest, and Ganzhou to the uh, east of Dunhuang. And these states all use different uh, administrative languages. Uh, Khotan, you know, use Khotanese, uses Khotanese, Torfan and Ganzhou uses Uyghur, and, and uh, uh, Dunhuang uses primarily Chinese, but also Tibetan. So how did these people communicate with one another? Um, so for that, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Dunhuang, we have this, uh, uh, these uh, excellent uh, sources that are very similar to the kind of uh, bilingual phrasebook that you'll find uh, in, uh, uh, in the bookstore um, uh, now that essentially gives you a very uh, a simple way of saying very simple things. Uh, so here I will give you an example. The highlighted part says uh, Shu Tangla uh, in uh, Brahmi script. It's from uh, the Chinese Shui Danlai or carry the water or bring the water, right? And then uh, the next sentence um, in this bilingual uh, phrase book says, uh, 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 bara, uh, which in Kodanese means bring the water. Um, so by using something like this, you will be able to say bring the water in Chinese or Kodanese uh, if you only know one of the languages, um, provided that you know how to read Brahmi, that is. Um, so uh, if we look further down, uh, these uh, list of phrases include things like bring the salt, make food quickly, um, you know, where you're going, I'm going to China, things like that, obviously uh, useful for travelers. These travelers also, uh, you know, delivered private uh, uh, letters. In, in fact, uh, you know, because of the lack of a uh, postal service, often these uh, travelers uh, uh, functioned as uh, a means to uh, transport letters uh, among uh, different people uh, in the region. And here is an example where uh, a monk in Torfan sent a letter along with uh, some watermelon to a monk uh, in Dunhuang. But in addition to private letters, these uh, uh, travelers also made official reports uh, about their journeys. And uh, here is a Cotonese uh, official envoy report back to the king of Khotan when and it was written in Dunhuang about the road from Suzhou, Suzhou uh, uh, that was closed uh, by the Tatars. Um, so, you know, these documents talk about uh, the condition on the road. And uh, and here, th this is not a document, but a uh, graffiti from uh, the Anxi Cave number 25, where uh, a group of people left uh, this note uh, in the year 900 about uh, how they visited a uh, sacred relic site. Um, and by looking at this, you know, um, you know anyone who has uh, traveled in China won't be uh, uh, surprised by by this because it's sort of a practice that uh, persisted to this day that people inscri inscribe their names to to famous sites. Uh, that by looking at this, we uh, get a sense of the activities of these travelers on the road. So you know, once you have uh, 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 your reports written, right? You've interacted with your host. You've given them. Uh, your gifts and you're written back to your government. What do you do uh, at the end of a trip? Uh, and here we have an example of someone writing to their host uh, back, uh, writing to their host, expressing their gratitude, their gratitude for the accommodation that was provided for them. And you know, with this, this lack of your journey ended and you can go back to uh, the beginning and start again. So these documents, I, I hope, show us that the Dunhuang, uh, uh, Dunhuang, the collection of secular documents in Dunhuang provides a, an unparalleled uh, base of sources for the reconstruction of, uh, of, uh, of long distance travel uh, in uh, medieval Eurasia.
Um, and this is sort of the base that I use for my book. Many of the stories that I tell, uh, uh, that I sort of introduced here will be told uh, in the book as well. So, you know, having, having uh, described uh, these, uh, these journeys, uh, now let's turn to a question that uh, is, is sort of uh, uh, broader uh, in a sense, which is when we look at these examples of uh, long, long distance travel, um, uh, the question to ask next is, is obviously, what are we actually looking at? Uh, what is the nature of all these different activities that we see in Dunhuang? And here uh, I, I take uh, an important, uh, um, and I, I sort of uh, uh, take an important lesson from uh, Vera Hansen's book and Vera Hansen's uh, very perceptive uh, remark on uh, the materials from Dunhuang, which is that uh, when we look at materials from this particular cave, cave number 17, um, there are actually not a lot of references to uh, merchants traveling long distance. Uh, there are two or three, um, but, but not many. So if we see examples of long distance travel, but you know, don't see a lot of merchants, then, then, then who were doing the traveling? Um, so now I'll give you uh, a few documents to show uh, uh, who these travelers were and the kind of frequency and the, the intensity of their journeys. Uh, uh, so the first document that I want, uh, I want to introduce is a official report uh, written by someone in uh, Suzhou um, back to Dunhuang. And, and here I'll show you the, the map. So Suzhou, as you can see, Dunhuang, uh, 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 to the east is Guazhou and then Suzhou. So this official wrote back to the Lord of Dunhuang uh, about diplomatic uh, 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 missions that the Lord of Dunhuang dispatched to uh, um, the Tang court. So this dates to the, uh, uh, the, the late ninth century. Um, um, the most important piece of news that this letter conveyed was about the death of Huang Chao, the you know, famous for uh, almost overthrowing uh, the, the Tang government. But in addition to that, this letter also tells us that at this time, at the time when the letter was written, there were four different uh, Dunhuang missions um, who were on their way back from Chang'an. And I've marked where they are on this map. So one of them is in Binjo, um, uh, uh, in Binjo uh, to the north uh, west of Chang'an. Uh, two of them were in Liangzhou. One of them is, is in Jialing. Um, so this shows us that at this very moment, there were multiple uh, diplomatic traveler, uh, di multiple diplomatic missions from Dunhuang to the Tang, uh, uh, happening at the same time. The second document I wanna show is about a monk who was uh, serving as an envoy for the Dunhuang government. And, uh, and this is a loan contract uh, from the monk. So the monk says uh, in this, you know, as you can see, very fragmentary text that uh, last year he served uh, as an envoy to Ganzhou. And then, he, you know, a, a few, uh, 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 one line down, it talks about the expense of his trip as an envoy to Khotan. And then now the content of this document, he is talking about how he was uh, uh, dispatched to Xizhou or Torfan as an envoy again. So what this fragmentary text tells us then is that uh, within one year or, or maybe a, a little bit over a year, this particular monk was sent to Ganzhou, to Khotan and to Torfan, uh, 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 you know, as the, uh, the representative of the Dunhuang government. So it shows you that not only was there travel happening, uh, the intensity and the frequency uh, of the journey uh, for this particular person. Uh, the third argument is, is, I wanna show is uh, what we call the Steel Holstein Manuscript. Uh, this is the document that uh, is uh, now uh, lost. Uh, nobody knows where it is but it is originally from Dunhuang and it is written in Kodanese and Tibetan. And it's a very complicated document that I, you know, uh, I described in the book and I'll probably 
uh, uh, write more about it uh, uh, elsewhere. But I, I just want to highlight one point where uh, uh, it mentions that two uh, envoys from Dunhuang, right? Two envoys uh, from Khotan uh, who came to Dunhuang uh, talks about the fact that this particular trip that was recorded in this document was the seventh time that they have uh, come to Dunhuang. And similarly, uh, a, uh, uh, in a, a biography for a Dunhuang official Zhang Baoshan, uh, and so I'm showing you this image, this is obviously not Chinese. The biography, the biography was written on the backside of this, uh, this document, where he says that he has served five times as, an, as envoys and reached the Naifold, meaning the, uh, the, 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 the Chinese capital in person. Uh, so similarly to the uh, example here, uh, we see that one traveler, one diplomatic traveler making multiple trips uh, uh, in their life. Here's another example of a uh, envoy named uh, uh, Zhang Xiuzao from Dunhuang to Turfan, um, right? Uh, he, uh, uh, Chongshi, he was serving as an envoy and there are two contracts of him loaning, basically borrowing camels for his journey. And both of them happened in the year 923. Uh, they happened uh, uh, only three months apart from one another, uh, which means that this particular person went to Torfan uh, twice in the uh, late spring, early summer of this year. Another example, and the, the last example, uh, 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 in this regard, is a Uyghur letter uh, 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 about a Turfan uh, envoy who came to Dunhuang. And, and in this letter, he says that I have been to the divine state of, of Yaglakar uh, or Ganjo um, once before, but I have been to the blessed state of Shajo, uh, meaning Dunhuang, four times already. So from these examples, we can see that uh, not only do we see long distance travel, we see people uh, traveling on behalf of their states often multiple times uh, in their lifetime, sometimes even multiple times in the space of a year or a season. Um, and and, and, and uh, even though we don't have a you know, comprehensive accounting of how many people were traveling from these, you know, admittedly anecdotal cases, we can see that uh, 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 travel, uh, you know, diplomatic journeys between these states were not rare occurrences, but they were actually quite common for these travelers. Um, the last document that I want to see, uh, I want to show is uh, from the perspective of a host. And this is a wine, uh, 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 one expended, expenditure list from the Dunhuang government uh, in 964. So from this year, we know that the Dunhuang government provided wine for Turfan envoys for 91 days and uh, uh, for, 90, uh, for 129 29 days for Kodanese envoys and for 143 days for Ganzhou envoys. So from a different perspective uh, in this document, we can see that not only were there a lot of travelers, a lot of diplomatic travelers, once they arrive at a, uh, uh, their destination, they always uh, they often stay for a very long time. Um, so this also attests to the uh, intensity and the depth of, uh, of of connections. So what do these uh, documents tell us collectively? Uh, I would argue that um, you know there's and zooming out right uh, after the Muslim conquest of Sogdiana in the eighth century. And especially after the fall of the Tang, the Tibetan and the Uyghur empires in the mid 9th century, um, the Sogdian immigrant network, the Sogdian merchant network that we uh, often associated with the Silk Road uh, had already collapsed. And scholars often take this as, uh, uh, as meaning that the Silk Road as a whole had come uh, into decline. What I have shown and what you know, I, I, I believe that Dunhuang documents show us is that uh, in fact, long distance travel uh, in the Eastern uh, uh, half of the Eurasian continent uh, persisted uh, after the fall of these three uh, large empires. 
and they persisted in a way that were you know quite intense. Uh, we can demonstrate that these journeys were happening uh, uh, on a regular basis. Um, and uh, importantly, the overwhelming majority of travelers that I can find in Dunhuang documents were traveling for diplomatic rather than commercial purposes. And it, it is for this reason that I call this network the King's Road. Uh, so importantly, I'm not using this term to replace uh, the idea of the Silk Road. Instead, I'm underscore. I'm trying to underscore the uh, uh, diplomatic or the government-centered dimension of this uh, of this network. So here, this uh, then brings us back to the concept uh, of the Silk Road. Uh, so having revealed right what the content of these documents are, uh, how does the Dunhuang material help us understand uh, the nature, the chronology, the, the, the you know, uh, of the Silk Road or, or whether we should use the, the, the concept of the Silk Road at all. Um, and, you know, I have a lot to say about this. Uh, and, and here I would, I'll just give you one more or two more examples uh, from Dunhuang. So, you know, I've mentioned that the vast majority of, of, of the travelers that I find in Dunhuang are traveling for, were traveling for diplomatic purposes. And here is a particularly well-documented uh, case that, uh, that Valerie Hansen uh, talks about in her book uh, uh, as well. That was a group of envoys who went to Chang'an from Dunhuang to Chang'an in the year 878. And they participated in the New Year's celebration in Chang'an and met the emperor in the Daming Palace and so on and so forth. So we can see that, you know, they probably went to Ganzhou and then, uh, you know, uh, follow this uh, this this route to Chang'an, and we know uh, uh, quite a bit about their journey because uh, a, a official report about this trip was preserved in uh, Dunhuang, and you know it's a, a very long and 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 very interesting document that I talk uh, a, a lot about, and I, I, here I just want to highlight a, a few uh, 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 key points, so. This document tells us that this group of this group of uh, twenty nine uh, 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 diplomatic travelers from Dunhuang brought to Khotan, uh, sorry, brought to Chang'an uh, one piece of jade uh, here uh, highlighted the the text Yu Yi Tuan, uh, one antelope horn, uh, one not two one, uh, and then one uh, uh, yak tail. Uh, uh, tail of a yak um, uh, to the Tang court. So these are the gifts that the Lord of Dunhuang give to the Tang emperor. And in return, if we follow this uh, text uh, 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 and, and read on, we realize that the Tang emperor provided a lot of return gifts to uh, these people in Dunhuang and not just to the Lord of Dunhuang, who supposedly give him uh, these three items as gifts. The Tang Emperor also gave a lot of gifts to the 29 diplomats who traveled to Chang'an. And these gifts include um, clothing, uh, yi, or, and uh, 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 silk, uh, uh, the different, uh, uh, different, uh, uh, different sort of amount of uh, silk, and then silverware. Uh, here are the silverware. Um, and uh, a part of this return gift from the Tang Emperor is called uh, uh, this very strange or interesting uh, uh, term, Tuo Ma Jia, or the price of camel and horses. What it means is essentially is, is, is something that was meant to cover the cost of, uh, cost of travel for these, uh, these travelers. So if we put this, exchange, if we look at this exchange uh, uh, from the material perspective of what was exchanged, uh, we can see that on the one hand, the Lord of Dunhuang gave the Tang Emperor one piece of jade, one antelope horn, and one yak tail. In return, the, the Tang Emperor gave back about 1,850 p of silk. 
And, and 1p uh, equals to uh, about uh, 12 meters. So you can do the math uh, and, and have a sense of how much uh, was given. Uh, about 42 sets of cloth clothing uh, and then 19 pieces of uh, silverware. So this is example number one. Uh, what it shows us is that uh, these travelers, diplomatic travelers from Dunhuang uh, and the Lord of Dunhuang were uh, acquiring, uh, acquiring uh, a, a substantial, substantial amount of goods in the form of silk, clothing, and, uh, and uh, you know, precious metal uh, from this uh, diplomatic exchange. Um, and there are many other examples uh, like this, but this is the most detailed and, and sort of most clearly laid out one. So this is the first uh, case that I, I, I want to talk about in this part. The last example, and the second and the last example I want to talk about is an entirely different uh, type of text. It's a, it's a lyrical poem uh, that was performed uh, at a, uh, 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 what we call the Noah ritual in on New Year's Day or, or New Year's Eve um, in Dunhuang. So it's a popular uh, poet, poem or popular song that, uh, that was uh, recorded in a Dunhuang document. So in the song uh, that expresses people's wish for you know, good things that will or should happen in the new year, uh, we see uh, lines like uh, the 10,000 commoners, right? Uh, regular people in Dunhuang, they sing songs with their belly completely filled. And the time that they lived resembled those of Shun and Yao. So these are the sage kings that lived um, before Confucius, supposedly, right? So they, basically it's saying that they lived at a great time. Uh, why was the time so great? Uh, the, 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 the text continues to say that, please do not worry about the Eastern road being blocked. In the spring, the heavenly envoys will arrive, meaning envoys from China will arrive and they will offer large jin silk with coiled dragons and different kinds of silk and textiles. So this is talking about the connection to the East, uh, but to the West, um, the song continues, uh, all the way into Kot uh, to Khotan, the road will be smoother than those covered uh, with cotton. And the Khotanese will offer precious artifacts and white jade, as well as a thousand types of cotton, silk, and other types of miscellaneous uh, cloth. And because of this connection between uh, uh, Dunhuang and the Tang, or, or the Chinese court, and uh, between Dunhuang and Khotan, and all the goods that, they, uh, uh, that, that were brought in, everybody within the border of Dunhuang will chant the song of happiness and enjoy the long life like Peng Zuhu, you know, supposedly lived for 800 years. So what do these two uh, uh, cases tell us? Uh, I would argue that uh, what they tell us is that, uh, in fact, for people in Dunhuang, uh, the idea of the Silk Road, uh, obviously they didn't use this term, right? Nobody uh, uh, in Dunhuang would have uh, been uh, calling what they are, uh, what, 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 what I'm describing as, uh, as the Silk Road. Um, nonetheless, the idea that there was a network that uh, connected Dunhuang to its neighbors uh, uh, in which precious goods, especially silk, but also other type, types of textiles were brought into Dunhuang that enriched the life of people in Dunhuang. I think this idea uh, was not uh, uh, foreign to people in Dunhuang. In fact, if you look at uh, popular songs like this, we can see that uh, um, uh, people in Dunhuang probably had very good sense of what, uh, uh, what we understand uh, as the Silk Road. In fact, if we, we you know, uh, 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 if we are able to somehow find uh, someone from medieval Dunhuang and, and kind of describe to them the concept of the Silk Road, I would argue that uh, it would not have uh, uh, fallen on uh, deaf ears. 
So to summarize what, uh, uh, sorry, this is part three. Uh, what I think this, the materials from Dunhuang as a whole tell us is that even though the concept of the Silk Road was a 19th century invention, the two elements, Silk and the Road, uh, are actually uh, uh, discussed extensively in Dunhuang documents, that people were very, uh, were very aware of their importance. They would, again, like, uh, like I've said, they would not have used it. Uh, they would not have used the term the Silk Road, but uh, I would argue that they uh, will, uh, they would have uh, been able to uh, understand this term uh, perfectly well. So uh, last slide, uh, I just want to give you an overview of, uh, of the content of the book. Obviously, I can't really talk to talk about everything that I talk about in this book, but 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 very briefly, uh, uh, this book is divided into three parts. First, I talk about travelers, uh, including people and things. And then I talk about how people actually traveled, what they did on, uh, uh, you know, with the geographical information, how did they interact with their hosts, how did they uh, uh, manage the goods uh, that they exchanged as gifts, and how did they uh, navigate the multilingual world of, uh, of Eastern Eurasia. And then the last part, uh, assesses the, uh, the the impact of this uh, network, uh, and and I, I I show that the goods, the gifts that these diplomats brought back to Dunhuang was actually central to not only the uh, economy of Dunhuang uh, and other uh, OEC states, but also central to the kingly expression of these uh, these uh, sovereigns uh, in these states. And as a result, uh, the 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 you know, two chapter nine here, the last one is chapter 10, uh, um, uh, 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 the, the road or the diplomatic connection uh, became a central theme in the political discourses in Dunhuang uh, from uh, the king of Dunhuang all the way down to commoners, their songs, their dreams, their fears. Uh, and, and in this way, uh, hopefully uh, 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 I will be able to show that uh, not only was there a network of long distance travelers that we, I, I would argue, can still call the Silk Road, uh, it was actually a uh, central presence for people in Dunhuang that affected uh, uh, essentially every aspect of their life. Um, so that is uh, all I have to say. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor Wen. That was such a such a rich and amazing talk. And I had the honor of reading your book manuscript recently. And, and I feel like um, I think what I find fascinating about your book is that we, as you mentioned, we commonly associate the so-called imagination, the so-called with empire, free trade, and merchants, but your study has really helped us rethink the kind of political landscape of the ninth and 10th centuries in which there's kind of more uh, fragmented political um, landscape, but then there's still a very robust, strong kind of diplomatic networking. And there's still a lot of stability. That's what I, kind of struck me in your book, that these smaller um, kingdoms uh, through diplomacy were able to kind of sustain a lot of stability. And I feel like it really helped me kind of rethink, um, again, this question of what is the Silk Road? So we already have quite a few questions coming in. So I'll just read them to you. Um, so our first question comes from Kathleen Young. Uh, Kathleen asks, there seems to be a lot of wine being used. Um, did the Chinese and Muslim drink that much wine? Drinking tea was already a custom as seen from the Tang tea ceremony utensils from Fan Lansu, a very famous kind of set. Uh, can you shed some light about the wine drinking habits of the time? Um, so, so here I had to admit that um, I, I'm 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 cheating a little bit with my translation because the text often just says "jiu," uh, and it's difficult to know exactly what kind of liquor is is being described. 
Um, so I kind of, you know, uh, uh, for the sake of clarity, I, I sort of translated them as wine. But but we know exactly, uh, we know for sure that there were wine consumed uh, in Dunhuang at this time. There were other types of alcohol, uh, but but there was uh, definitely wine uh, uh, being comfort, uh, consumed. Um, the 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 sort of um, you know drinking habit uh, that really struck me. Uh, in terms of the uh, in the context of this book, is how frequent uh, alcoholic uh, uh, consumption was in the sources. So people were provided, you know, again I'm translating as it is wine. People were provided wine prior to their uh, departure. So basically, there's this um, a banquet. Uh, that often was uh, were held in uh, suburbs of the the main city, uh, where you know people were given wine. People were provided wine on their way back. Uh, you know, in Dunhuang we had these uh, this very uh, you know interesting expression called nuanjiao banquet, uh, ruanjiao banquet, soften your feet. It's a banquet that helps to soften your you know travel hardened feet. Uh, and at these banquets, uh, wine were also provided. But most importantly, and most sort of interestingly, as the expenditure accounts that uh, I've, I've, I've um, uh, used uh, shows, wine were provided on a daily basis for these uh, travelers by the government, meaning like every day they get, uh, 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 they get some. So much so that uh, we have complaints uh, from the winemaking households in Dunhuang. Uh, about you know the fact that they couldn't they could not keep up. There are too many envoys coming in, and they all demand wine, and we cannot keep up. Uh, and there's this one uh, very uh, interesting petition. Um, so you know I think that kind of shows you one dimensions of the wine consumption uh, uh, for these travelers. But thank you for the question. The next question comes from Professor Valerie Hansen. Uh, she says, Eunsin, congratulations on your book's imminent publication. The cover is lovely. Uh, since you are the first Silk Road scholar who can read all the original documents in Tibetan, Cotonese, Chinese, and other languages, would you mind discussing the differences between the materials in Chinese and in non-Chinese languages? Are there any genres in non-Chinese languages that do not exist as far as we know in Chinese? Uh, in Chinese, thanks. So in Dunhuang, there, uh, in Tibetan, there's this, this, this travel permit that I have not found uh, in, in Chinese uh, anywhere. And it's kind of similar to, you know, earlier period, the, in, there's a, this, uh, this Tokarian travel permit uh, uh, from, from Kutra, I think, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that's also, you know, very interesting. Um, but but in Dunhuang, so in Tibetan, there's that that uh, document. Uh, the uh, letters of introduction for uh, a a monk using the the, the sort of uh, 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 Qinghai road uh, that uh, uh, that uh, Sam and Imre discussed in their books. I uh, also have not found parallels in the in the Chinese sources. Uh, there are many, many Cotonese uh, uh, envoy reports. In fact, the, 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 the beginning of this uh, project was really uh, from you know, my, uh, uh, my seminar or my uh, you know, uh, courses. Uh, the course I took was uh, Professor Octor Sherwell uh, reading these uh, envoy uh, reports in Cotonese. These documents really don't uh, exist uh, in Chinese. And then something like the the Steel Holstein uh, uh, miscellany, um, the, the the one that is lost uh, that we only know from a 1940s publication. Um, in this book, I try to argue that that document is is essentially a traveler's notebook uh, that contains a, a different genre, a various different genres of texts, and that's why Bailey calls it the mis miscellany. Um, including uh, poems that were, you know, quite uh, uh, literary, um, and 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 you know, uh, 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 official reports. 
uh, as well. So that kind of uh, sort of document that were produced by travelers about their daily life uh, on the Silk Road, uh, we don't really see them uh, in Chinese. But on the other hand, there are a lot of Chinese texts, you know, rounders of Chinese texts that we don't see uh, in these uh, in these non-Chinese sources. Like you know, we have many many contracts uh, 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 by and for travelers uh, in Chinese, and I have now found one uh, in Cantonese, uh, for example. So, yeah, thank you for the the question, Barry. Um, I think there's a question above, um, but anyways. Um, so uh, the next question, I guess, comment comes from Janet Baker. Um, she says, so it seems that the silk and other textiles were an important diplomatic gift item. Perhaps the phrase uh, silk road can still be used. King, the King's Road applies royalty and representatives of royalty. Certainly a number of travelers were also religious pilgrims it was a road for many purposes, uh, which changed uh, with various time periods. Um, and she says, thank you for this excellent presentation, Professor Wenxin. Um, I look forward to your book. Yeah, um, that's absolutely right. And, and in fact, in one of the chapters, I, I, I use these Dunhuang uh, paintings and then compare them to mural paintings to compare them to Song uh, uh, images of uh, emperors and empresses uh, to show that uh, even though these people, these sovereigns uh, uh, that were you know, physically removed, uh, physically thousands of miles or you know, over a thousand miles uh, 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 from one another, uh, ruling over different subjects, um, they were actually dressed in ways that were very, very similar to uh, one another. Um, and that, I think partly is the result or the impact of what I call the King's Road, meaning that uh, it created this, you know, interna international elite of, of medieval uh, uh, Eurasia. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, rich people these days, they all were, you know, I don't know, I don't really know a lot of rich people, but like, I assume that they have Gucci bags or things like that, right? And, and that's the sort of currency uh, for these um, uh, 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 these kings and these uh, these aristocrats, and uh, they gain goods and uh, uh, and exotic things through the diplomatic network, and they put them on their body. So that's a one dimension, you know, very much about representation. But more importantly, I, I think the reason that I called it the King's Road is because the, the, the network uh, of, of travelers and the sort of infrastructure that supported the network were provided by these different uh, governments on the road. So much so that when we see these accounts of Dunhuang government, for instance, providing wine, providing food, providing paper uh, to and providing clothing sometimes to uh, envoys from other states, you don't really see them giving anything back. Um, it's a sort of one-way street. You know, it, it, the fact that you are a diplomatic traveler entitles you to a lot of things that other types of travelers do not uh, have, uh, have the privilege of, of having. So that tells you that at least this particular uh, uh, dimension of the, 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 the network of the uh, of long distance tra long distance travelers were very much maintained by the government. Uh, so the government not only benefited the kings, or not the government itself, but the the sovereigns of the government, not only benefited materially from this network. They also, or maybe because of that, they also were interested in maintaining it. Uh, and, and in these diplomatic letters, we also see them talk about how this road would make us a family. Uh, people like the King of Dunhuang and the Han of uh, the Uyghur Ganzhou state, they would talk about the fact that we're brothers on the road. Uh, so I think that's also a dimension of uh, the King's Road. Uh, you know, an important note that I had to really need to, need to emphasize is that I'm not saying that there weren't merchants. 
uh, or there weren't uh, religious travelers. There were a lot of religious travelers, as I, as I have shown. Uh, but many of them were also doing uh, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, things at the same time. Some of the, the diplomatic travelers to China also uh, go to uh, Wu Taishan uh, when they finish their official duties. But the Dunhuang collection, the collection of Dunhuang documents is a very biased uh, uh, um, source base. Just because we don't see uh, commercial travelers in Dunhuang doesn't mean that they don't they didn't exist. Uh, but you know, if in the future we have better sources to kind of look at these uh, these uh, people, maybe there is a uh, merchant's road uh, that existed simultaneously uh, to the network that I'm describing. Yeah. Um, so our next question is from Professor Susan Huang. Uh, she says, thank you very much for the inspiring talk. Looking forward to reading your books. Uh, can you elaborate a bit? Um, what is the purpose of preserving such diplomatic documents in the Dunhuang uh, Library Cave? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Susan, for the question. So, you know, as you, uh, uh, as you know, and as, uh, as scholars of Dunhuang uh, know that the Dunhuang Library Collection, uh, Library Cave, you know, there are a lot of debates about the nature of the, 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 the collection and why it was sealed. Uh, I think I, I uh, you know, agree with uh, uh, Valerie and I agree with, agree with uh, Imri and, uh, and Sam. Uh, uh, that this collection is something between a uh, library holding of a monastery and a uh, repository for uh, Buddhist relics. It's sort of, there's a spectrum. It's sort of, it, it, we probably shouldn't understand it as entirely a, a, a library or entirely a, a collection of uh, sacred waste, uh, right? But the question that people have not really talked about too much is, okay, so let's say it's a, it's a uh, somewhere between, uh, between that. Why do you have all these secular documents, including the diplomatic, uh, uh, diplomatic uh, letters? Uh, you know, from Dunhuang documents, we have examples of, of monasteries collecting uh, contracts, used uh, texts of, of, of contracts, monasteries collecting um, government documents. So, and there are actual examples in the, in, in the collection of secular documents being you know, applied as supporting material for Buddhist texts. So I think essentially they were collected as you know, used papers uh, uh, for, you know, if you're running a library, Obviously, you need a lot of papers to maintain your holdings, right? To help you uh, one way or another. Uh, and I think these secular documents entered uh, the library uh, or entered the collection uh, in that way. But these diplomatic letters were particularly good because many of them use very good papers. Uh, they use very high quality papers. So, you know, if you're familiar the, the, the big one with the Chi, right? Uh, Paleo 5538 uh, was preserved in the Dunhuang collection uh, intact. And I think that's, uh, that has something to do with the quality of the materials that were used in these sort of high prestige documents that, that these uh, monks found uh, particularly appealing. Um, so that's sort of my understanding of this question. Um. So, so the next question, you already kind of touched on this, but uh, mm -hmm. it's from a Marion Ho. Um, how did you come up with the idea of writing this book? Did you come across some of the documents and then decided to search and research for information on the same theme? And how long did it take you to write the book? Wow, how long? Uh, I guess I, I started, you know, my sort of um, my general exam uh, after... 2014, I think it was when I started. Uh, 2013 and 14 was when I started. So it took about 10 years. And uh, the, you know, uh, 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 reason, or I, I sort of started it uh, when it's, it's, you know, it's an interesting kind of maybe not very uh, relevant uh, point, but 
kind of random because I was taking Codonese with uh, Octor, uh, uh, with Zhangjian, with my friend Zizi, uh, who um, uh, is now a postdoc at Oxford. Uh, and, uh, you know, our, our mentor, our professor, uh, uh, Professor Octor Sherwell just uh, said that, you know, you guys, between you two, Zizi should work on Codonese documents from Kotan. And Wenxin should work on coding these documents from Dunhuang. So that was decided that way. And that's sort of how I got into these materials. But also, you know, I, I when I was at uh, Beijing U University, I studied with um, uh, Professor Rong Xinjiang, and he's really the person who introduced me to really anything I know, you know, any bits of pieces I know uh, about anything uh, in my academic life. And um, uh, at the time, my focus was on uh, Dunhuang, uh, was on Torfan documents and Cotonese uh, or documents or documents from Cotan in Cotonese and in Chinese. Uh, um, and I didn't really work on Dunhuang materials, but you know, uh, being such a, a giant in Dunhuang studies uh, himself, he had been a, a, a constant inspiration for me to you know and and, and, and encouraged me to get into the more difficult and but also richer uh, uh, Dunghua materials. I think there was someone uh, before that asking about merchants uh, in murals. Um, oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, Tijun asked, um, good evening, Professor Wen. Thank you for this amazing talk. It is interesting that a Dunghua documents barely mention the mer merchants while well, you see their presence on the murals, do you think the keepers of the documents intentionally selected these materials? Um, I, I sort of touched upon this a little bit already. It's a, because these are uh, documents that were collected by Buddhist monks for their collection of documents or as a library or as a secret waste, the text that they can get hold of the most easily uh, tend to end up in uh, in this collection. That is why. So when we you know uh, talk about secular documents in Dunhuang, the best represented secular documents in Dunhuang are secular documents made by the monks themselves, uh, and these are documents that were studied extensively by uh, uh, scholars like Hao uh, Chunwen, um, because that's you know, that institution obviously was very close to the monks. And then the Dunhuang government was very close to the monks. So the Dunhuang government's document very often ended up in the library. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 the sort of foreign diplomats, they, you know, visit these uh, monasteries sometimes. So, so they're lo a little bit removed. So we have fewer documents about them, but there are still some. I would imagine that you know, commercial travelers were probably even further away socially from these monks. And that's why their documents uh, don't end up in the cave. Doesn't mean that, again, like I said, they didn't exist. Um, this is one reason. The other reason is that the reason why we see all these depictions of merchants on Dunhuang murals, uh, it's, not, it, it's not because they were painting their daily life. They were painting these Jataka stories based on Buddhist texts that talk about merchants. Um, very often it's the case, right? These 500 merchants uh, go into the sea, for instance, uh, there were canonical sources for that. Um, just like I, I sort of uh, I was looking at this, I mean, I think uh, Anne, Anne's research touches on this. There were a lot of paintings of river and water in Dunhuang mural paintings. Doesn't mean that there were a lot of river in Dunhuang or a lot of water and boat traveling in Dunhuang. Uh, so the murals, they have their own logic that we kind of have to treat them as a different uh, 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 genre and not a direct reflection of uh, what life was. Um. Thank you. Um, and we have a question from Bill Nugent. Um, is there a rough equivalence in the value between yaktail, antelope horn gift, and uh, 1,848 AP of silk, 42 suits, 19 pieces of silver. It, it would seem not, is the apparent lavishness of the silk suit silver benefactor intended to show his wealth, generosity, regard the travelers 
uh, for the travelers or is it a big store of uh, trade goods to initiate or promote commercial activity? So the, I, I think this is the key point of the book, which is yes, and there is no equivalence uh, uh, in the value of the exchange. Uh, if we don't know how big the piece of jade was. Um, and, you know, an antelope horn, I mean, it, it's, it's a precious uh, object, but uh, these objects, the, the, the jade, antelope horn, and the yaktail combined, uh, there's no way that these things were considered uh, in the material sense, uh, as as valuable as the gifts that were given uh, in the other direction, and this I think points to a central difference between what I'm describing in this book and what people often imagine the activities on the Silk Road to be. When we consider the Silk Road to be a primarily commercial uh, 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 world, then things were you know, things of equal or similar value were exchanged. But what I'm seeing in my sources is that uh, the way that a lot of these uh, uh, materials were exchanged uh, occurred in the context of what I call competitive gifting. Mm -hmm. um, and here I'm, 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 I'm learning a lot from the you know, classic studies by, uh, uh, by Maus, uh, by, you know, uh, Marshall Salins, uh, about, you know, in Salins's uh, Stone Age uh, uh, economics, uh, he talks about all these big men, right, spending wildly to gain prestige. In the competition, uh, it's important to give more rather than give less, right? In a bilateral relationship, if, can, if I can overwhelm you with my gift, then I win this competition. So, so people actually had incentive to give more. Um, and in the Dunhuang documents, we have cases where clearly, uh, you know, there's a list, similar list between the, uh, the Han, uh, the Uyghur Han and the Tang Emperor, where um, it specifies uh, uh, the fact that the, uh, the, the Tang Emperor were giving back more uh, to the Uyghur Han than, uh, than, than he initially received. So why is that? I think, you know, the, the, the work of Mouse and Silence really gives us a key to, understand, to understanding this imbalance, which is this process essentially reconfirms the unequal relationship between the Tang Emperor and the Lord of Donghuang. Because the Tang Emperor can overspend can win this gift competition uh, in a way that, that, that the Lord of Dunhuang, there's no hope for him to compensate, uh, to reciprocate in an equal way. By participating in this exchange, the Lord of Dunhuang is essentially uh, uh, succumbing himself to the, to the Tang Emperor. Um, so it sort of reaffirms this unequal relationship. And this is the dynamic the central dynamic that I'm seeing in these sources that sort of drove the exchange of goods um, as gifts. And I think oh, we have another question from Professor Gilratz. Um, thank you for this fascinating talk. Um, I really look forward to reading uh, to your book. I wonder how far west did the network extend? Mm -hmm. Are there documents re recording envoys or travelers from the Iranian region or Western Asia? Um, the short answer is no. Um, it, in Dunhuang, it, what we're seeing is, is uh, it seems like a um, pretty clearly Eastern Eurasian world. Um, there are references to places west of Kashgar, um, uh, particularly because Khotan, uh, the Khotanis uh, were fighting uh, the Kalahanids, and the uh, the Kalahanids were, uh, you know, based in Kashgar and 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 further west. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, because of that, uh, we have references to the Kalahanids, and we have references to the goods that were, you know, uh, that were uh, brought in uh, in from that direction. I mean, you know, the antelope horn that was not uh, native to this part of the world uh, it has to come from further west. 
Um, there are also references to elephants being captured and then moved uh, through this region and the elephants must have also come from further west. Um, but by and large, and, and, and in Song and, and you know, Tang and Song sources, you often see people, uh, diplomatic travelers from further west traveling with uh, uh, Dong Huang envoys, traveling with Turfan envoys to uh, the Song court. Um, so these are references to places further to the West. But other than that, uh, it, it really is, for the most part, about what we call Eastern Eurasia. One thing I want to, I want to emphasize is that it's not a small world. Uh, if you travel, you know, I, I did a little Google map experiment that, you know, the distance between Kaifeng and Khotan and this is the distance that these travelers regularly cover. There are many, many Cotonese uh, 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 envoys uh, going to, uh, to the Song court. The same distance, if you travel from Khotan or Kashgar further to the west, you almost reach uh, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the Caspian Sea. So it's a, it's a you know, even, uh, even though it doesn't really, you know, mention, uh, people from the further west, it's still an extensive uh, uh, area. But the question is, you know, why? Why don't we have uh, uh, references to uh, two people, uh, two travelers further to the west? Um, and I think one example of, of the uh, letter from the Kitan Han to the, uh, uh, to the Kaspani uh, 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 Han in Central Asia, where, you know, the Kitan was trying to uh, uh, Han was trying to establish a uh, diplomatic relationship. Um, and this relationship in the text was called a relation of mutual donations. So it's very much about uh, gift exchange. Um, but the answer was that you guys were not uh, Muslim and were not interested in connect in having you know diplomatic connections with people so far away. It's kind of uh, a, a lot of work for not a lot of uh, benefit. Uh, to them, so I do think that the 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 the, the Turkic speaking Muslim world, Turkic you know Persian uh, speaking uh, Muslim world, form a kind of world onto itself that uh, that we don't really see in Dunhuang documents. Um, you know, is it because they were insulated from the rest of the Eurasian world in some way that you know, diplomatically, the connections were not as close, uh, maybe, but there are counter arguments because the Callahan is maintaining a very close relationship with the Song. So I don't really know why, uh, but I, you know, I, this is a great uh, question that uh, deserves to be considered carefully. That's fascinating. Um, so our next question is from DZ. Uh, DZ asks, is paper, uh, this is probably talking about uh, the Dunhuang documents, is paper reused by the monks? Can it be written over for uh, religious purposes? Yeah, paper were reused in any way that you can imagine uh, uh, in Dunhuang. So they were rewritten, right? So uh, they're written, uh, you know, if you have a document that had empty space, you know, very often people would uh, uh, use the empty space to write other texts, to write practices, to make drawings. Uh, 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 there are even cases where, uh, and this is one of the texts that really kind of nightmarish uh, 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 reading, reading the document, uh, where the text was written um, uh, once, it was, an, uh, it was about a Kodanese uh, traveler to, to Dunhuang. And then it was turned around and then wrote a second time over the first text. Um, so because the handwriting is different and there are gaps, so you can sort of read both, but they, you know, they overlap in a way that uh, that just makes your head explode. Um, so you know, paper was a precious commodity that was reused. Uh, uh, as writing material, but importantly, they were also cut off. They were made into other ritual objects. 
uh, one of the documents that I uh, look at in in the um, uh, this is in in, in Paris. Uh, a half of the document is preserved, and they're like zigzagging cuts that were you know uh, that, uh, on one side. That you know I I didn't I, I thought it was just some random cuts, but if you put the document over a white light. You can see that the cuts were actually uh, that of a paper flower. So people were cutting documents up to make paper flower. You can see the the, the, the outline of these petals. And then in 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 uh, in uh, uh, at the v VNA, there are you know uh, paper flowers discovered from Dunhuang that were uh, preserved there. So you know, people are reusing document, reusing paper, and not only as writing material, but in, 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 ver in various other uh, different kinds of ways. Um, our next question is by Dennis Lowe. Uh, mm -hmm. Dennis asks, is there any mention of the presence of uh, any women in the Dunhuang world? Yeah, um, there are. So, you know, I'm talking in the, I guess I, I kind of revised your question a little bit. In the Dunhuang world, there are plenty of references to women. Uh, you know, there are many elite women. They're doing all sorts of things that a lot of nuns and uh, Dunhuang mural paintings. You know, donor images, plenty of women. Uh, but what surprised me in doing research for this book was that they were women are were actually also uh, 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 active uh, in the diplomatic realm, uh, which you know you would all probably assumed was a, 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 an exclusive uh, male space. Um, and it was still, you know, uh, certainly male centered, but you see cases of women. There was one case of a nun from, uh, from Ganzhou um, who was the head of a diplomatic uh, uh, mission to the Song court. Uh, in the Song sources, it says it was there were only three people. It was the nun and then two other people. So the nun was the head of the, 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 the mission. But then it also talks about all the horses that they brought. So you know that it could not have just been only three people. It must have been a much larger group. And, and there you see one example of a, uh, a, a woman actually serving as the head of a diplomatic mission. And then uh, in other documents, you see that wives and children would often travel with diplomats. Uh, so, you know, they were very much part of the diplomatic journey. And because there were a lot of uh, sort of uh, interstate diplomatic marriages, many of these uh, elite women, like, you know, uh, uh, the daughter of the, uh, the, the Lord of Dunhuang would be married to Kotan and she would go to Kotan and not only her, but her entourage, and that involved uh, a lot of women. There's this very interesting document by a, um, a, a, a female kind of attendant or, or servant to the Cotonese prince who was married to Dunhuang, but she was back in Cotan at the time. So this female servant was writing back to uh, the Cotonese prince and the Cotonese kings and the ministers asking for, uh, you know, uh, clothing, asking for jade, asking for painting material for mural painting uh, in the caves. Um, and there you can see that it was a woman who was organizing all these things, right? Who was organized, was active in these diplomatic networks and organizing the communication of information of goods uh, uh, between these different places. So. That is a very long answer to say yes. Um, so I guess this is probably our last question. Um, it is from Melissa Morton. She says, uh, hello, thank you for this wonderful lecture. At the beginning of your talk, you mentioned local provisions, stuff you need for your journey, uh, food, drinks, paper. Is this paper for uh, trade and use or papers needed for your travel? Yeah, paper was, um, I would say cent central to uh, the uh, life of these diplomatic travelers. Uh, there was this record of uh, a group of, you know, Cotonese travelers or Cotonese envoys who uh, arrived at the Song borders, but they didn't have 
their uh, papers with them. They didn't have the official edict. Um, they didn't have uh, uh, documents to, to, to show that they were actual diplomatic travelers. So they were almost turned back. They're like, there's no way for us to know who you were. Um, so that's why in, in Cotonese, there's this very interesting document where it, where it, where it tells you how to treat the, uh, the text of the physical object of the uh, official letter that was written on paper. Uh, it has to be put on the first horse of the diplomatic uh, uh, mission. And then, you know, once you dismount, you dismount that uh, document first, and then everyone else to uh, uh, dismount, and then they had to pay it, you know, respect to the document, document as if the document is the, well, it, it is kind of an embodiment of the king. So, um, so official letters, very important. They also exchanged, uh, you know, they also had to write reports back home. So that, you know, for that they would need papers. Uh, they kept notes um, to themselves. They wrote poetry. Uh, and, and we have these uh, poems about, you know, whenever they get to a place, they write a poem about that place. Um, if they keep notes like that, they need paper. Um, but very importantly, they also transmitted paper uh, as uh, transmitted books as gifts. So there are cases of Dunhuang envoys uh, uh, delivering Buddhist texts to uh, the Song court. And then uh, the Song court giving Dunhuang uh, uh, Buddhist texts. Uh, so in this sense, and I have you know, a, a segment talking about this, the world of the diplomatic, diplomatic travelers uh, was filled with paper. Um, it was really the paper and the documents that, uh, and, and the text that they carry uh, that give meaning to uh, these, uh, the life of these travelers. Otherwise, you know, who knows who, who you are, right? Um, so uh, I, I think, yeah, paper was, uh, was very uh, central to the story. Um, so there was, uh, there was one, uh, Vladi, uh, the second question, I think uh, we kind of missed. Uh, maybe all the way yeah. up back. There's a, there's a, I guess this is more of a of a ask. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh. So I, I can kind of put you in touch afterwards. Okay, all right, sounds good. Yeah, and I think we're exactly on time. So great, uh, um, Professor Ben. Thank you so much for being with us tonight and shedding light on the life of diplomats and helping us really rethink the, the Silk Road once again and, and kind of giving us this amazing kind of detailed vision of the life of long distance travel. Um, and we can't thank you enough for agreeing to kind of share your new book with us.